Five Rings Podcast, your weekly amateur sports and Olympic sports show with Dwayne Rollins and Kevin Laramay. And now, without further ado, here's Dwayne Rollins. And welcome to the Five Rings Podcast, coming at you a little bit later in the week, a little bit later in the day. It's later in the day because Kevin woke up this morning feeling a little under the weather. We originally were going to hold it off for one day, but uh, but he's, he's a trooper and he joins us now. Kevin, how are you? My pusher is called the Tylenol Extra Strength Cold and Sinus. I'm doing a lot better than I was a couple of hours ago. Yes, no doping for Kevin. Speaking of doping, <laughs> uh, we had an interview. Uh, I'm the king of the segue. We had an interview earlier this week with Evan Dunphy, who is the, the Canadian record holder in the 20K uh, race walk. And although we, as much as we'd like to talk to Evan about his career and focus on that and race walking and all that sort of good stuff. And I think that Kevin and I talked off air that we might uh, bring him back one day and explore those kind of questions. Uh, much more serious topic uh, when we had him on um, some, some doping story, uh, some allegations of corruption in Russian athletics. Uh, he tells it better. So we're going to, we're going to run that interview, which happened Monday. Uh, Kevin did that alone because I was at the Javinko press conference in, for TFC for Toronto FC, so I was unable to be on the interview. But uh, it was an interesting conversation. We've already put it out as an interview only, but uh, we're going to run it again now uh, for those that uh, that get this through uh, through iTunes and, and maybe didn't see it or, or what have you. Uh, it was so- really interesting, Dwayne, to talk about uh, to talk to Evan about the story, how we uncovered it all, cover up this almost a spy story, some of the elements. Some of the elements is doping itself. Uh, being a cyclist fanatic for many, many years, I wrote an article back in the late 2000 and before 2010, like 09, 010, about the doping when Armstrong Contador. And it really goes in the same vein. And we have chat about organized doping, and it's a great conversation. All right. So why don't we take uh, no further uh, ramble now and uh, run that interview? Then we'll come back, talk a bit about it a bit. Uh, have a lot. Also, we're going to talk today about the end of Turfgate and uh, an unfortunate story involving Hope Solo and, and sort of how we cover women's sports. That's going to be our final topic. But before we get to that. And welcome back to the Five Rings podcast. It's with great pleasure that we receive today Evan Dunphy, the Canadian record holder for the 20 kilometers world record attendee. Uh, all-around great athlete, but more important right now, investigator as well, who his story got an Associated Press, The Guardian as well, a uh, big story out of Russia. First of all, Evan, how are you doing this morning? Oh, great, thanks. Thanks for having me. It's our pleasure, seriously. <laughs> uh, there's a big story that you wrote a couple uh, last week about what's going on in Russia, and I'll let you just explain the gist of it to our listener and to uh, set the, the story in context. Yeah, for sure. Well, um, so as a, I, as a race walker, I tend to follow all the race walking news that I can. And uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, some photos were posted on a Russian sort of social media website that featured uh, photos from a race in December. And it was pretty peculiar that this race, these photos seem to picture um, a couple of athletes who are currently serving doping bans, which is you know, a lot of violation. Mm-hmm. Um, while you're competing, you can't, or while you're serving a doping ban, you can't be competing uh, in any any manner, uh, even if it's a local competition. Um, so this was caught. This first caught the eye of uh, a few people. It was posted on a couple of race walking specific uh, websites and stuff, and just sort of figured that more needed to be done about this. That we needed to make a bit of bit more noise because uh, you know, the current state of Russian of Russian with, with all the doping that's going on and mm-hmm. the, uh, the uh, investigations into the into the sport in, in general. Um, just thought that this needed to get out there a little bit more. So we started looking a little bit more into it. Um, and as we were doing this, um, the Russians actually came out and, uh, and tried to claim that these photos were um, from 2012, that they weren't from a race in 2014. Um, so we sort of ran with that and, and quickly found out that, well, no, this is impossible. They were wearing uh, shoes that weren't available in 2012. There was a number of inconsistencies that lent to the fact that there was no way it could have been from 2012. A lot of uh, anachronism in the pictures, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and then, um, then these new uh, these new photos appeared that they said, well, no, like these are the photos from twenty twenty fourteen, and they featured just the athletes that weren't on doping bans, which was convenient. Um, how, but there was you know a, again a huge number of inconsistencies with these photos, and uh, and it looks like these have been staged. You know, these were staged two weeks later. Um, 
to you know to to spit their narrative of of um, these athletes not competing. So it's it's been a and you know sort of wrote, wrote a blog post about that outlining sort of what had happened and and how and how they had broken a lot of rules and stuff and how they were trying to cover it up and it gained as you said it gained a little bit of press and got out in the Guardian and uh, I think Fox Sports ran a story on it as well and um, I think that put a little bit of pressure the IWF looked and started investigating and uh, the first big thing we had come through was a couple days ago um, the IWF and um, Viktor Balakshniev the president of the Russian Athletics Federation announced that in fact, three athletes had been competing that weren't allowed to be competing. And one of these athletes was Sergei Bakulin, who was the world champion in 2011 in the 50K walk. And the interesting thing about this was that this is the first time it's ever been announced that he's been serving a doping ban. Okay, that was kind so, of like a surprise. Yeah, so, so you know, someone's been keeping this. Yeah, they, they just hit him for like two years, like, oh, no, he's not serving a ban, but uh, unofficially he was. Yeah, so he's been. They've they come out and said he's been banned since December of 2012, and it's a bio passport um, yeah. ban. So it has, has to do with with blood doping and tracing his values over time and level of and, uh, testosterone. You know, they're saying that they're, yeah. yeah, and it's part of a um, ongoing investigation. But you know, two years is a little ridiculous, and and so it was, and the other interesting thing, thing to look at that case was that two of his teammates, who are currently serving lifetime bans, were. Um, have their results stripped back to February of 2011, which is uh, which is from a race uh, in Russia that they did that uh, Bakulin also participated in. So you can imagine that they also have a blood value for him from that point. Um, so there's some motivation on the Russian side, at least, to want to keep this quiet because if his ban was to get backdated to that point, he'd lose the World Championship gold medal. Yeah. Um, so you know, don't know if that's the case, but it. You know, there's some good motivation there for wanting to keep the secret, and this, you know, to announce that he's been banned since 2012 is you know, that two years. I, it seems a little ridiculous for for an investigation to keep going um, of this nature. If we're talking about the Lashmanova case a little bit more specifically, and the fact that she joined Victor Chegin's camp uh, in Russia and in the Saransk Race Walk Training Center in more, the state of Mordovia, it, it seems like it's a state-sponsored training center where. I don't know how allegedly almost anything goes. Uh, just to let us know, to talk about a bit more about Victor Chagin and uh, Lashmanova specifically. Yeah, of course. So Victor Chagin is the sort of the national race walking coach there. And it, I, it should be mentioned that um, it, in the state of Mordovia, race walking is their state sport. It's huge there. It's, um, it's probably where it's the biggest in the entire world. Yes, yes. And this, the, this Sarantz Training Center opened up in uh, 1994. And they've produced... A number of world champions, Olympic champions, um, more than any other other training group and country in the world, probably. And uh, the only problem is that Victor Chagin, under his tutelage, has had, I think the number's up to 23 now, athletes. Wow. Um, serve doping bans. Th th and that's not a coincidence. No, no. That And these are all athletes that trained out of this center in, in Sarantz. And on top of that, the Sarantz Center receives... Um, in excess of two million dollars in funding, um, some of which is is government funding. C so, compared to the other country in the world in race walk, that's uh, tenfold, if not more, than oh, anywhere yeah. else in the world. Yeah, it's infinitely more than 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 most other other places get. Um, and, and I think that's one of the reason why the, this story is harder to get it out fully is because race walk is not as glorified as a sprint is. Even though, uh, if you're talking about a, a sport performance, it's mind-boggling to me when talking about the 20k and the 50k and it's really similar in a way especially with tactics the way cycling can be ran me as a big cycling fan i hated to always bring it back to the reference of cycling but for me and with the doping it's easier for the listener to understand and to uh, relate to it in a way but uh it's really mind-boggling to me that it takes this much for because now we're talking about 23 athletes from the same place it it's organized it's almost Yes, we have to say it's allegedly organized, but it, there's almost no other way that can happen. Yeah, exactly. And, and it, you're right. It is. It hasn't got as much uh, attention that it should have had. It should have because of the fact that it's race walking. But I mean, it, this this center can be looked at as a microcosm for the entire mm -hmm. what's going on in the entire Russian Federation. I mean, True. you. This is the most successful uh, program within Russian athletics, 
and that shouldn't be taken lightly. The comparison I, I, I tried to draw for um, some people on, on Let's Run, um, the, the, the famous running forum, was that you know, take the Nike Oregon project, which all running all runners know about um, the Alberta Salazar coached program in, in Oregon that's that's producing some world champions, Mo Farah and Galen Rupp and stuff. Now imagine that you had I mean imagine that Salazar now had was had twenty three athletes that had failed doping tests, was still allowed to coach. And on top of that, you know, the Nike Oregon project, say their funding wasn't coming from Nike, say it was coming from the, you know, the US Olympic Committee. That's what you have here and I don't know why people um, people aren't making a big deal about that but because in all fairness uh, on a different scale is exactly the same what happened in the 90s with the u.s postal team that was with government funds that happened exactly. in the state too and it really brought that to mind having followed that uh for many many years and wrote articles about it I, I was really seeing parallels left and right exactly yeah and in and in this case um with lash Manova, so I guess it should also be mentioned that Lash Nova is the world champion, Olympic champion, world record holder, yeah. um, which you know again should make it a little bit more high profile. Um, it should really the- raise questions about all the results they had. And one uh, thing that was really interesting to me, continuing to see, it's not just the the, the hitting of the cover up is all that. It's their, their levels with the biological passport too has been off for many many years. Weird things happening in the last decade from that center since you mentioned it. It's a it's surprisingly that you just keep that going. It is. Well, it, it, I, I don't want to say it's surprising because from everything I've seen now um, in their attempts to cover it up and, and just re- have digging a little deeper into the center, it's pretty apparent that these doping bans in Russia don't have any impact. They don't, they don't mean anything to the, to the athletes. They're still viewed as champions. They're still... They're clearly still training with the training center, even though they're on their band. They're clear. It doesn't just taint the aura like it does in North America. Exactly, um, and even even on on the Sarant's uh, website's homepage, where they, their little about me section, they list some of the athletes that have been training with them, and they list uh, Herman uh, Herman Sig- uh, Skirgan, who was the originally was the um, world champion in 1999, but had that result taken away because of the doping ban. And on the website, they list him. You know, they list him as being the world champion in 1999, so clearly, you know that it, it's not as frowned upon as it, as it is in North America. It's sort of like, oh, well, you got caught this time. You know, you'll come back and, and try again. It's more a society that's trying to find a loophole not to get caught instead of changing the mindset towards uh, sports performance. Yeah, and it's it's uh, it's pretty. It seems to be pretty endemic. And I think the only way to put a stop to this is to hand down. Bigger sanctions to, um, in this case, starting with the Sarantz Center, Victor Chagan should definitely be given a, a long, a long ban, and all anyone involved in this cover-up should be given a ban because that's just where you have to start. And if uh, if any of these allegations from the German documentary, the ARD documentary, looking at systematic doping in Russia as a whole, yeah. if any of those can be proven, you know, it's well within the IWF's right to sanction the entire Russian Athletics Federation. And I think that's where we're going to have to go if this is ever going to stop. Unfortunately, my co-host couldn't be here today, but he sent me a question, and it's a talking point we had a lot of time on this show about old world records from early 80s, early 90s even, when there was systemic doping going on in many different countries in the Eastern Bloc and all that. Especially in race walk, there's 16 men's outdoor records from the 90s and two from the 80s. And on women's side, it's Eight from the nineties and an absurd twelve from the eighties, and the eight hundred meter is from nineteen eighty three. Uh, do you think that those records are have to be tainted, and are we will be able to achieve those performances? Clear. Yeah, the, the, some of the records are clearly tainted, especially if you look on the women's side with um, Flojo and the sprints, and you got the the Chinese middle distance um, athletes from the early nineties that were you know, part of a pretty big doping ring there um, that just you know, were lucky enough never to be caught because at that time getting getting testers into China was pretty much an impossibility. Um, and then you have the East German throwers and, and stuff like that. So it's, it is, it's pretty hard to look at those records and have and give them any sort of um, credibility. 
So, but at the so same time, do you have to, as an athlete, sorry to interrupt you, but as an athlete yourself, do you have to, are the records your end goal or are the performances against your peers today on the same era are more your goal and your achievement you strive for? I think that's, yeah, that has to be more what you look at. And I can really, really only speak for me personally, but you know, I, at the end of the day, I'd rather have an Olympic medal than a world record. Uh, and I think a lot of people out there feel the same way. The world record is you know, icing on the cake sometimes if you can, if you can get it, but it shouldn't be something that athletes are, are striving towards unless they're at, unless they've separated themselves from the rest of the world. If you look at people like Usain Bolt, who's, you know, he had nothing less to compete against except for those records. In cases, you know, in rare cases like that, I think you start setting your sights on the records. But other than that, you focus on being the best of, of your generation first. To, to close the negative chapter of this part of the interview, uh, what should we do going forward uh, as the IAAF Federation or just Russia Federation itself, if it wants to start policing itself the right way, what, what should we do going forward? It's it's hard for me to say what's going to happen with the IAAF and, and uh, with Russia and, and with the Russian Anti-Doping Association because there's so many moving parts right now that you know I, I can I'm not going to sit here and pretend like I know half of what's going on. Um, but I think one thing that needs to be done now is that the athletes themselves need to start standing up for uh, for clean sport. Uh, I know there's some high pro uh, uh, Robert Harding, uh, the German world the world champion and, and Olympic champion in discus. He's He's starting to stand up and and and, and uh, have his voice heard, which is a, which is a pretty loud voice um, against these these actions. And I think we need more people to follow suit to really uh, um, really start putting the pressure on these federations to actually do something. Um, you know, this all the stuff in Russia going on, especially with the race walks, and yet they've been awarded the World Walking Championships uh, in 2016 and 2018. And, you know, that's un unacceptable. Let me guess it's going to be in Saransk. Uh, in, it's actually in Chebaksari, which is their, which they have a rival training center there, which is a little bit funny. But, you know, there's absolutely no, absolutely no way that these events should be allowed to be given to Russia in the current state of things. And I think that's just lack of pressure on the IAAF to, to really take this seriously. All right. To, to end this interview and to talk a bit more about the positive side of thing and give people hope about... Sport is still nice and very important to everyone and can be a catalyst for good things in society. Can you tell us about your upcoming season, Evan, adding into Toronto and into Rio? Yeah, so this is um, 2015 will be an exciting year for me. Uh, in 2014, I was lucky enough to have a pretty good year and set a pretty large personal best and broke the Canadian record. Mm -hmm. uh, 20 walking, kilometers. Walking 20K in just over an hour and 20 minutes, uh, which That's is impressive. Yeah, four minute kilometers. So this year, uh, looking to do much of the same, got a bunch of international races early in the year, and then Pan Am Games in Toronto will really be the big one, hoping to get on the podium there. And, and We'll and be there, by the way. Me and Dwayne will be there to support you. Oh, that'll, be, that'll be wonderful. The race walk will be a great event. It'll be uh, one of the few free events, um, so everyone can come out and, and, and take part in the Pan Am Games and come out and watch the race walks and the marathons and, and see some of Canada's top athletes. So that'll be really exciting. And then, I'm a big um, fan of strategy in a race walk, especially because it does correlate with cycling a lot, and I can understand it. How would you describe yourself as a race walker, and what do you prefer to do? What's your favorite tactic? I don't want you to give anyone any secret, but <laughs> what do you prefer to do on the course? It's you know, it's more about for me. It's a huge a big thing is knowing what I'm capable of and know and just having confidence in my in my game plan. So uh, our World Walking Cup in in uh, this last year in May, uh, where I broke the gain record. It was one of those races where the race went out a lot faster than I expected, and and I was feeling good, but I just kept telling myself, you know, hold back, hang back, like stick to your game plan, and uh, they'll outpace so himself, and they'll they'll gas out, and you'll catch up, and you'll be yeah, able to go. Yeah, so, so I went through 10k. I think I was back in 35th or 36th position, or something like that, and just kept sticking to my guns and being confident, knowing that I'd I could come back to them, and uh, I think by 15k I'd moved up to 16th place, and by 20k I was in 11th place, so. Um, you know that worked for me then, but now it's it's you have to take you know the strategy has to be different every time you race. You have to know who you're racing and and what your goal is. Is if your goal is for a fast time, you're going to race differently than if your goal is to place well. Uh, let our listener know where they can reach you, where they can send you. Uh, 
support, the encouragement heading into your season, uh, where can the listener reach you? Yeah, so um, I'm pretty much everywhere um, on, on Twitter and Facebook. Uh, just search for Evan Dunphy. Um, I got a new website out where I've been doing this blogging for the Russian um, stuff, as well as having a personal blog and 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 stuff about you know, just about my story and stuff like that. And uh, that's dunphywalks.weebly.com. And uh, all the links will be available on the description of this show as well. Yeah, perfect. I'm I'm too cheap to upgrade to the <laughs> expensive account where I can get rid of that. You know, I can get my own domain name, but that that works for me for now. So. Yeah, those are the best places if anyone is interested in following along. Uh, Evan Dunphy, thank you very much for taking the time for talking to us today. Continue your battle against, I was going to say corruption, but yeah, it is corruption. Against corruption, against shady things going on behind the curtains. Uh, it's 2015. Privacy is almost non-existent, and I think it should apply, especially in the world of sports. Transparency is the key going forward. Yeah, definitely. If your phone, like mine, sucks, and it's constantly being filled up by all of these podcasts, all of these archived podcasts of the Five Rings and Two Solitudes, there is a solution. Stitcher Radio, everyone. Download the app. It is the greatest app that has ever been produced for the iPhone and for the Android. Download it now. You won't fill your phone up with more Five Rings and Two Solitudes podcasts because it'll all be there on demand for you to play anywhere you want on Stitcher Radio. And welcome back. Thanks again uh, to Evan for, for both doing the work to uncover the story and for taking some time for us. Um, as I said before, and as you just heard, I unfortunately wasn't able to be part of that interview. I regret that, but, you know, TFC and some work where I get a little bit of money for uh, took precedence. But uh, And like five press conferences in the last 10 days. Oh, I'm exhausted on that front. Um, I was thinking about doing a two solitudes today, but then then the whole idea of talking about MLS exhausted me for a minute. But uh, then you realize we did three already this week, and it's only Thursday. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's more news happening tonight too. Uh, you can read my Twitter feed at 24th minute if you really want to find out what it is. But at any rate, um, yeah, Kevin, do your takeaways on the interview. Very interesting. The point of view of an athlete looking at, at the world record issue of them not even thinking about world record anymore because their career in the 80s and 90s are kind of like tainted. And the way they're looking at the performances, it's against the peers themselves. Uh, personal times or against athletes from the same era that they directly compete against. World record are not even an afterthought. Unless, like he was saying, you're an athlete like Usain Bolt. And the only thing left to achieve is to beat the world record. Other than that, world records are an afterthought. So that just tells you how much mainstream, we don't talk a lot about doping, but the more we follow those type of stories, the more we follow blood values in the biological passport. I started doing that in the last couple of weeks. Old ones, the last decade. And the last decade has been, uh, there's a huge problem. And I don't want to put a percentage on it, Dwayne, but doping is huge in every single sport. And in society, in the entire world. Well, yeah, it's it's. Look, there are. I sh I hesitate to say it's human nature because it's not human nature to be unethical, <laughs> but it is part of the human condition in yes. some people, right? It's more uh, of an acquired condition, but yes, it's a human condition now. Yeah, it, it's it happens, and we we recognize that it happens, and we're always chasing it. You talk about the world records, and that's the one that fascinates me because I've been a track fan. Forever, I ran track when I was younger until uh, my teenage years and my teenage uh, desires got in the way in a lot of ways. Um, but you know, I, I always loved the the whole concept. The whole sport is built around the idea of PR, is personal best, PBPR, whatever you want to call them. And that the world record, of course, is the ultimate extension of of the personal record, the personal extension to challenge yourself further. That's the essence of what track and field, what athletics is, right? Yep. So to have those world records taken away, and they really are. No one looks at them anymore if you're a track fan, really, because you all understand they're friggin' ridiculous. Uh, the world record of the women's 800-meter outdoor, 1983 it was set. Are you willing to tell me that we reached peak female performance in 1983? No. With nutrition that was in 1983 was like, what, a beer and a bowl of pasta before competition? Yeah, it's absurd. I mean, we talked about that with the high jump too. Um, I, you know, the the women's one that makes my blood boil every time too. And that woman is dead, so we can say she was as dirty as dirty can get. And you know, it still stands. Ben Johnson, if we want to make Canadian, 
he still holds the indoor record in the 50 meter. He's still the official record holder. What does that tell you? Yeah, it's true. Uh, that's a very telling case, specific case that you just mentioned. The fact that the indoor 50 meter record of Ben Johnson. It's, it's still the official world record. There is an asterisk beside it in the book. Well, on Wikipedia, anyway. I don't know if it's actually in the book, but it's just absurd. So what are you going to do? Well, you're right. <laughs> and uh, that was one of the things that the last couple of days I'm trying to write. Because there's many different doping stories in different sports. There was John Jones in MMA. Not the cocaine story, but the testosterone level that were practically inexistent. And that's not normal for a 27-year-old. Stuff like this that you don't see. That you need to, to dig deeper to see it, and it just raises so many questions for somebody like me to follow a lot of different sports and can judge different aspects of a lot of sports, and there's a huge cloud on every sport in my mind right now. Yeah, there's, there's the two biggest problems facing sport, in my mind, are, are both that speak to the integrity, to the, to the reality of it, to, to whether it's a, the competition is fair. And the, the one uh, is doping. That's a huge one. And the other one is match fixing, which I, both of them, and I think neither one of them gets covered a much, uh, uh, not as much as they should. Um, I, I can know. understand why, because it's like probably the worst vices any sports or any event could probably have. And the worst confident altering uh, rumors you can have is if max or fix or if uh, people are doped. So. Yeah, and it's easier to fit to focus on the extreme. You mentioned the cocaine uh, test. I mean, it's a drug, but it's obviously not a performance enhancing drug. Um, but that uh, one's going to get the high headlines, right? Exactly. Unless you're, uh, I was going to say some event that you need to be hyper or whatever, but uh, no, it's not a performance enhancing <laughs> drug at all. No, yeah. Well, back in the 50s and that, they, the baseball players used to basically be all revved up on speed. I don't know whether that was actually enhancing their performance, but it... Uh, oh, was that why the first baseman was always hogging the line? Really, really close yeah, to it? Maybe. I don't know. Anyway, I wasn't around. We're not going to talk about that today. All right. Um, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's Kevin, we, we, we are going to say goodbye to a friend now. Uh, moving on, we're going to say it's a sad moment in the in the Five Rings uh, history right now, Kevin. Let's hear it for the last time in one second. Come on. Let's talk about Turf. Let's talk about Turf. Let's talk about all the good things and the bad things that make me. Let's talk about Turf. Let's talk about Turf. turf. Let's talk about Turf. For baby. the last freaking time. Yeah. Well, you know, we're more excited than half of the media reports were the other day. In fact, I, as much as I covered that sport and that ter- that story, I should say, and lived it for a lot of time in November and December, it's telling to me that I ultimately found out about it as I was standing waiting for to scrum Greg Vanny, the head coach of Toronto FC, in a casual conversation between Vanny and another reporter that I overheard the other reporter go, oh, so they dropped the, the lawsuit. And I was, because I was busy doing other things, I had to commute up to the podcast, or to the podcast. To the press room. Party and sleep, the press, press conference, and it was like, well, that, I guess that's over then. Um, it's over. The uh, What we've said all along, that there was a no chance in hell that they were going to win this thing, and that was based on both our intellectual interpretation of what was going on and talking to lawyers and listening to people that were outside of the PR hype of it, um, it simply was just never going to happen, and now it's not going to happen. Um, Kevin, what what ha- what did they accomplish? What what have the women accomplished by by doing this? Did, did anything? Do you think this remark is not going to be made to make make fun or make light of the situation? The only thing they really accomplish is tarnish their reputation. Just because the fact that they tried over and over after clearly people tell them they had no case with a lawyer that was maybe over a zealous and they pushed the situation way too far and at the end of the day I think their aura as a star uh, if you were talking about Amy Wambach and Marta is blemished after this affair than before yeah I guess it depends on where you're listening to it and that's the one takeaway that I have from this is that it was very the, the way it was reported on was exceptionally different um, in the United States versus uh, the rest, well, I don't know about the rest of the world, but in Canada, certainly. And it, it unfortunately got bogged down into partisanship too often. Uh, I don't think anyone had a real conversation about turf at any one point. I think their insistence on labeling it as dangerous, as as trying to present it as this this 
that that it was universally accepted that it was that it's dangerous that it was proven that it was dangerous that to me is what offended me about this the most is because as much as I don't like turf either for a lot of aesthetic reasons um there simply is not proof that it is day more dangerous and that was to me the bottom line they were intellectually dishonest in how they were presenting their case from the get go i don't care that their opinion is that they don't like it that's their opinion and they're entitled to it but it is irrelevant to the conversation and it is irrelevant to proving that the per- that the turf is more dangerous it's it's like saying that i don't like the color blue therefore blue is dangerous that's pretty much what they were saying but i don't agree blue is a beautiful color Dwayne. why would you hate blue actually i like uh, sky blue sky blue is lovely uh, at any rate um but no but i agree with you you're totally right it's But now, you know what? It's over. It's done with it. We'll be able to focus 100% on the tournament coming up this summer, and it won't even be an afterthought then. Well, yeah, you'd hope. And that is my one thing here. Like, I mean, I I do have a little regret. Since it got to the point where it was clearly not going to expedite it, it, the expediation request was turned down, and we knew that it wasn't going to be changed before the World Cup. There was no chance of a last-minute, you know, Hail Mary working, that... I think that I kind of wanted it to go to trial at that point because I wanted the turf to go on trial. I wanted to have an honest conversation about turf. And that's the one thing that we've lost is had it gone to the tribunal, they would have been forced to actually try to back up that opinion that turf was more dangerous. And, you know, I I can't help but think that maybe part of their decision to pull out is because they realized that they – there's no way they could back up that opinion. And had they gone into a a legal uh, location and – been unable to prove that it was more dangerous than a precedent would have been set that it was in fact not discriminatory to play tournaments on turf and they basically would have you know assured that there were going to be more tournaments played on turf right i guess they would argue i'll i'll end it with this that to play a bit of devil's advocate to ourselves that their argument would be that they brought forth the attention that this shouldn't happen and maybe have has have done something to ensure that future tournaments are held on grass. I don't know. I don't agree with that. I 100% don't agree with that. I think that the future, as I'd hate to agree with Sepp Blatter, but the future really is synthetic surfaces, and that goes for the men's and women's games. That's always been my position, that this idea that they won't play men's games on turf in 20 years is just, I don't know where people are coming from that. Technology evolves, and it is ultimately going to be economically more feasible for places to to have synthetic turf. That's where it's going. It's not there yet because the technology isn't there yet. I don't agree with how I, I wish that these, this World Cup was being played in grass. I really do, do. But I am so glad that this conversation is done because we need to focus on that tournament as a tournament, as a sporting event now. Absolutely. And we need to focus on the team participating and to hopefully uh, what's going to be great football on, uh, on pitch. All right. Speaking of distractions from the Women's World Cup, Kevin. Oh, you're going there. I have never on this podcast before said TMZ. I'm about to. (laughs) Hope Solo, folks. And we're not going to break down Hope Solo and what happened other than to say, like, unless you're living under a rock or not at all tuned into women's soccer news, Hope Solo, the... Uh, legendary or infamous, however you want to put it. I think infamous is probably more fitting now. U.S. yeah, goalkeeper, uh, you know, a, a very good athlete, one of the, the top players in the world. Uh, you know, and, and a player that has had um, her share of like, troubles, we'll say. And I don't know whether her troubles are more exposed than others or that there's that there's probably an argument to be made that because she's in a, you know, some She's an attractive female playing in a high-profile area that her troubles get more exaggerated by certain people. That's absolutely probably happening in some cases. But the, the reality is that she she does dumb things when she's drunk sometimes, and her husband does really dumb things when he's drunk, and they have come to bite her in the ass a lot. Yeah, I don't think she is more exposed than anybody. I think she's a polarizing figure, and those figure unfortunately, for the good reason or bad reason, do get more public attention. Just go talk to Miley Cyrus, Justin Bieber, those type of people that are polarizing for the good things and for the bad things. Sometimes when it's for the bad things, it does come back to back to in the ass, like you said, and 
that's what's happening. It's not because it's you know not people are not being unfair or just uh, getting set on her case really more than all the other ones. No, it's just that she's polarizing. People click when it's about her, which is good and bad things, and that's why the reaction and that's why the the media coverage it does it gets. Yeah, and anyway, I don't think I actually ever painted it out what happened. Uh, yeah. Hope Solo was suspended for 30 days from the U.S. Soccer Federation um, because she was an, a passenger in a car that was uh, that Jeremy Stevens, her husband, uh, was uh, arrested in for drunk driving. Um, it came out today on TMZ that that car was in fact a uh, U.S. women's national team labeled vehicle. So not only was she in a car with a drunk driver, which is poor judgment, she was also in a U.S. women's national team identifiable car that we don't know whether or not she was allowed to be in with um, with a drunk driver. And that that is ultimately what is coming in is why she was suspended, why the U.S. soccer acted now, why they didn't – she's had other incidents in the past where she wasn't suspended. They've That's a very uh, protective community, we'll say. Uh, they've often um, ignored calls to suspend her. This time they didn't, and it's because she was in a U.S. women's national team labeled car. That was the big issue. When it comes to Hope Solo, Kevin, and, and then we're going to move on the conversation from her specifically from here, I think that she's a celebrity at this point, right? Yep. And that's how she's reported on. Yeah, of course. I, absolutely. I don't view Hope Solo stories, and, and there were people last night that were uh, trying to tie her coverage into the overall coverage of women's sport. Uh, I think that that's a really worthwhile discussion to have, and I think we're going to have that conversation right now after I'm done saying this. But I don't think Hope Solo is the example to use because she is not covered as a sporting figure. She is covered as a, as a celebrity, just like other bigger name male athletes are covered as a celebrity as much as a sporting figure at this point in time. It's now it, it's about the it's about the clicks and it's about trying to to get a, a famous face out there and uh, use their their pratfalls to the advantage or the economical benefit of, of whatever source is doing that. So moving on from Hope Solo, Kevin. Um, I did want to talk about how we cover women's sport because that is a worthwhile coverage. And just by saying we, you're including every mainstream media out there, I guess. Yeah, well, I'm glad to know we're mainstream now. That's that's lovely. But <laughs> or, or you're including mainstream media and us. Yeah, I'm talking about global. Yeah, when I say we, I'm using the global we. Um, you know, and I think that all of us at times are uh, guilty of falling into tropes and stereotypes when, when we talk about women's athletes. And it's one of been a battle that I have really consciously tried to fight um, in myself for my career uh, right from the get-go. I have always, as I said last night on Twitter, I don't – I soccer is my main thing that I cover. And I said, look, I don't cover women's soccer. I cover soccer and women sometimes play soccer, uh, right? So I just try and cover women the same way as men and I try and – that to me means that you you have a critical eye towards everything that's happening from an on-field sporting perspective and that's how I've always tried to cover women's athletes. However, I think we all at times, and I'll include myself in this, fall into this idea that women's athletes are different, that we have to treat them differently, that maybe we should be um, treating them as heroes more than as simple athletes. Um, you know, Not to say that we don't treat male athletes as heroes. Uh, sometimes, but uh, certainly there is amongst some people this idea of the great, you know, role model, the feminist role model, whatever that exists out there, right, Kevin? Putting the athlete on a pedestal. Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of fandom in women's sports that that is at a different level sometimes than than you find in men's sports. There's a, they, they hold the players up. Many hold the players up at a higher level. Look As at her. As, She's an inspiration for a generation. And she might be. And it's not always. I'm not saying it's 100 percent wrong, but I'm saying no, no, that no, you're right. No, but you're right. It's just uh, you don't get as that as much as with the men as you do with the women. It's like it's that story is being that storyline is being pushed all the time. There's also this, yeah, and, and that leads to uh, questions not being made about people. And there's a defensiveness when when anyone tries to cover them as normal athletes, when tries to question their decisions. When and I'm talking about sporting decisions here, like, and no one covers women's sports like that. Um, before I've, got we get into I've got a great example for you, Dwayne, that happened this week. Yeah. We talked about it off air quickly. Let's just take two athletes that we can relate to it and they're in the mainstream media. Let's take Jeannie Bouchard and Milos Raonic. Mm -hmm. Did you ever hear any journalist ask Milos Raonic who he would like to date in the, in the world? 
No, no, you you wouldn't. Yeah, how many times? How many times did you hear Ginny Bouchard answer that question? Uh, many times, and it's awkward. Or the twirl question. She was asked, and this is causing a lot of controversy right now. She was asked by like this creepy middle-aged oh, yeah, man. The twirl. Fuck. Yeah. yeah. Could you twirl around? I mean. Um, Eugene Bouchard, I don't think anyone's going to – we're not living in a rock. She's a pretty girl. We under, all understand that. But when like a middle-aged man tells her to twirl around and show her outfit, that's – there's the creepiness to that. That's – that's there's not even a debate about it. It's sexist. Yep. It's just pure sexist. And and we need to recognize that. And But there's always a pushback from people that say, oh, no, it's not. It's harmless and all that. And look, she likes to get money off of modeling, so – which is victim-blaming. And and it's all the ridiculous conversations to even have. But and it, it speaks to exactly what we're saying here. It's how we choose to. There's two ways that we choose to to cover women's sport when we're not making them sex, sex symbols or uh, political leaders. Um, we're also making them pure. They're pure as a driven snow, and they're they're human interest stories. They're not sporting stories. We rarely cover women's sport as sport we cover it as human interest and that's the inherent problem and it's based on how we perceive women in society i have a feeling that if you're looking at a mainstream media type of perception the people usually and i'm gonna put them all in the same basket and i'm gonna generalize a lot so yes i can open myself for criticism for that but you'll get my point at the end uh main the people in charge of mainstream media are not necessarily the people that are most connected with the world, what's going on today. You're talking about usually it's an uh, old man with white hair. And that is not representative of the population and of... The, they're out of touch, that's what I'm saying. And for them, they think that to get the sport over and to get the people to get interested in those sports, you need that human factor. And I think it's the exact opposite. Both you and I have been interviewed this year, uh, women from the Canadian Men's National, uh, women's national Team from uh, Short Track, and we never ask any other question than sport-related question. Uh, that's it. Not even the study. No, it's always sport-related. And we go to that meat of the interviews and we try to get our gossip or our uh, interesting tidbits of information on the sporting aspect of it. And the rest, we couldn't care less. And I think we are really have here on the Five Rings Podcast and all the other shows, Dwayne, we are conscious about it. But I think it's time that other people take that stand of consciousness and realize that they do need to cover it as the sport aspect. And then, for me, I think it's going to get more popular because if you tell people that it's worth it to talk about it just for the sport, maybe they'll get interested about it for the sport and not for the other aspects. Yeah, I mean, this all speaks to, to media criticism in the sense that they're the gateway stuff, that the, that other people can't po- – there's no worth, there's no positive uh, benefit from covering things that I don't like. If I don't like women's sport, then you won't. So that's kind of the attitude that you'll find in a lot of places, and they just don't cover it. So, and then it gets into a chicken and an egg argument because they will then go on to say, and I, when I'm using they, I'm talking about you know the capital M media, mm-hmm. uh, will say that you know why? Well, the reason we're not giving more more pages, more time, airtime to women's sport is because our our listeners, our readers aren't interested in women's sports, and then fans and advocates for women's sport will come back and say, well, the reason they're not interested is because they don't. They're not exposed to it, and they can't become interested. And it's a chicken and egg, and it's never ending. And there are, you know, I think that we, you know, we need to acknowledge that uh, that you can't force people to like things, and that there is a difference in popularity, and and that uh, there is a balance to be made there because you know media is a, a corporate uh, entity in some cases. But I think that media also needs to recognize some sometimes uh, that there is uh, value in trying. To expand their readership and their 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 reach by covering things that maybe aren't as popular as other things, and and certainly you know I'm from a men's sport here, something near and dear to Kevin and I's heart. Uh, you see it in the soccer front that the, in the last ten years there's been a massive increase in the amount of of mainstream soccer coverage in Canada and the United States, and that has in fact increased the popularity of that sport to the point where that coverage is now more and more justified, right? I seen TFC make the first page of the Toronto Sun. If you would have told me that ten years ago, I'd never believed you. Yeah, so that's where the chicken and egg argument comes. Can can women's sport get to that point? Maybe. Um, you know, last point on this, and I, I do think that uh, that there is uh, 
an element that we need to get past to uh, that is sometimes embraced by women's fans, and that is this idea that there's their ethics are higher and their and their play that they play the game is pure. Nothing makes my blood go boil more. Well, it's the second time I've said that phrase today, so obviously I'm overusing it. <laughs> One of the things that frustrates me a great deal is when I hear people say women don't dive, and I'm talking about soccer again. Bullshit. Of course they do. They do everything that men do. There's every... Even worse, if you've seen that college vid girl on YouTube that actually punches the other player in the back and then elbows her in the back while playing soccer, that's a famous video. Go on YouTube. Just write the NCAA woman and it's the same sport, and it should be treated the same way. Yeah, well, that video angers a lot of women's soccer fans because it, it's the only thing they got covered, right? Like, they don't <laughs> talk about women's soccer. They just talk about, ah, oh, look at this. It's a cat fight, which is sexist and creepy all at the same time again. It's frat boy crap, but at any rate, um, yeah, exactly. Like, there are every single type of male athlete that exists. There's a female athlete that's the counterpoint to it. We've got to stop globalizing female athletes and treating them all the same. We've got to treat them as athletes. We've got to treat them in the exact same way. If we're going to cover this sport, if we're going to be serious about sports journalism, we stop trying to make them pure as the driven snow. Understand that there are there are going to be women's – when I talked about the – I refuse to say her name, the 100-meter world record holder who was – one of the dirtiest athletes in history. She cheated in every single way, just as badly as Ben Johnson did, but yet she doesn't get the same level of villain attached to her because she, because she's women. Is that part of it? Probably. We've got to stop doing that too. And when we get to the point where we are equally critical to, to women when it's appropriate and we're equally praising them and we're holding them up to the same standards as, as men, then we've reached something, but we're still a long way away from that, Kevin. Absolutely, and when you uh, try to, it, there was there is a double standard, and when you're trying to break that double standard, sometimes now you're getting backlash. People are like, oh, we know you because you hate this and you hate that. No, look at what I do for the men. I'm trying to do the same thing for the women. I don't. We don't want to have a double standard. We always ask questions about what they're doing. We might even ask questions that go further about tactics, about their training, about they just want to talk about it. I have in my mind. Two examples this year that I talked to when I was at the 100 days before the U20 World Cup in the beginning of the spring, I interviewed two players for the U20 Women's National Team. And when I asked them questions about their training regimen and their tactic that they love to implement, you should have seen the spark that was lit in their eyes. They never were asked questions about their sport and were able to let their passion flow freely on a microphone before. And that's what we did. And you can listen to those interviews on a, a couple months ago on the Five Rings and Two Solitudes. But that's what they want to do. Just give them the opportunity. So just stop asking them to pose for a picture and maybe talk to them about their motivation in the sport. Then your article might get more click on it. Yeah. All right. Um, I think we've uh, convinced the world. We've uh, made it a better place now. Right, Kevin? Yes. And uh, we did. Absolutely. 100%. We've solved it all. No, of course I'm lying. I, I'm I'm teasing. Uh, it, it's a conversation that's going to continue for a long time um, but I thought in you know tying it into the Hope Solo news and look as a last summary on Hope Solo I I hope Hope Solo, forgive the pun there, um, gets help because I think she clearly has some substance issues uh, from what I can tell. I, I think she might have a problem with alcohol from what I can tell and I don't know the inside story. I'm just doing basing this on media reports. Uh, so let's hope she gets that kind of kind of support she needs so, so she can uh, you know function better. Um, however, I, you know if we're going to cover this story, uh, we should recognize that from a sporting perspective that uh, that uh, you know it, it needs to be be covered too. And that's the last thing I'll say on that. Yeah, like I mean, one of the things I think think, and I don't want to speak for them, that I think was frustrating. Um, Woso only fans last night was that everyone's talking about Hope Solo, but no one's having you know any critical conversation about the U.S. Women's National Team right now. Like no one is questioning Jill Ellis's uh, 
decision to continually play Abby Wambach in important games, even though it's clear to anyone who has a knowledge of the sport that she's fallen behind. That's the conversation we should be having about the women's national team, not necessarily Hope Solo's crazy world. Like, yeah, I, she should be suspended for a month for what she just did. There's no question in my mind for that. But that's kind of irrelevant. It's done now. Why is no one that's happy to jump on that story and get the clicks also having a conversation and having an, you know, an intellectual debate about whether the U.S.'s all-time leading scorer should be on the team? Because that's a more important question from a sporting perspective than what Hope Solo is up to today. And if you're a woman athlete and you're listening to this show right now and you have an opinion about it, you agree with us, you disagree with us, you want to continue that conversation, you can always do it on Twitter, at Kev Laramie, at Five Rings Podcast, at 24th Minute, where now all our new shows are posted on YouTube. So look at the comments section below. You might not want to do this, but if you want to talk about this show, you want to have that conversation, let us know your feeling on the comments section right below. All right. That, I think, is it for the week because we've done a lot of shows this week. We'll be back on Monday unless I really get excited and want to do a show tomorrow. And you never know because that seems to be what we're kind of best at. Uh, in the meantime, Kevin, why don't you say goodbye and we'll thank Evan one more time for, uh, for taking the time for us. On your podium, folks, and just check the Five Rings Podcast YouTube feed for new shows, old shows, videos. Uh, you'll love it. And take care, folks. <laughs>